everyone, it's John from What Up, and welcome back to another video. This is my Easter egg video for episode three of Sony and Amazon's Wheel of Time show that is currently streaming on Amazon Prime. In this video, we're gonna break down all the little nods and neat little tidbits to the fans of the series they included in the episode. So if you haven't read the book series, you may have missed some of these, and if you have read them, well, chances are you noticed at least some of them, if not all of them. Now, I do wanna preface this by saying I'm probably not gonna get every single Easter egg in these videos, so if I don't, leave a comment down below and let me know because I'm gonna do a video at the very end of the season detailing all the Easter eggs I missed that you fans have picked up on. Now, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. I'm putting out two to three videos per day of Wheel of Time content, so there's a ton of content coming from me. Now, before we get into the video, spoiler warning, in this video I'm talking about Easter eggs that are in episode three of Sony and Amazon's Wheel of Time show. So, if you haven't seen that episode, I'm gonna ruin the entire episode for you. And if you haven't read up to and including book 14, yes, that's every single Wheel of Time book. There's going to be spoilers from probably most of them. And every single Easter egg video I do will have that tag. We're going to spoil everything just in the off chance that I talk about something that happens later on in the book series. All right. All of that being said, let's get on to the video. All right, so we're going to start with this. This is the opening sequence of Episode 3, and in this sequence, we see Nynaeve kill a Trolloc with its own belt knife, and then they both go under the water. When she rises up out of the water, the blood from the Shadow Spawn basically makes a Dragon's Fang on top of the water, kind of showcasing the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai. Very neat, very cool. Now, we've seen this before. However, uh, this is the first time we've seen the full sequence. So that's the first Easter egg we had in this episode. Second one I want to talk about is this. Now, in the background of this particular scene, there's a song playing, and the song has a lot to do with the relationship between Lan and Nynaeve. And I won't ruin too much of it for you, even though I gave spoiler warnings right up until uh, book 14. But if you want to look up what song is actually playing at that time, uh, you'll understand that that's what he calls her later on in the book series. And a lot of the male parts are sung when Lan is on the screen and female when Nynaeve is on the screen. Very neat. Very cool. Um, it's very subtle, however. So I didn't notice it the first couple watches. until It wasn't until I started listening to it that I recognized the song off Lauren Balfe's soundtrack. And I went back and I listened to the song. And I was like, lo and behold, this is the one playing in the background when they're there. Really very cool. I thought so anyway. Um, also, something I wanted to mention, I couldn't get a good picture of it, but a lot of people have been saying that Nynaeve's earrings basically are the snakes biting their own tails, sort of like the simple eye to eye rings that used to be produced by Bandai Jewelry a long time ago, and the ones that we would see in the book series. I couldn't get a good shot of it, so if anyone does, send me a picture of it. I'd love to see that, uh, because no matter how often I pause or zoomed in, I can't really make out the snake biting its own tail, but if someone else has one, I'd love to see that. All right, now we're gonna talk about Perrin's dream. This is really interesting because at the first of Perrin's dream, he's waking up in bed without his wife. And as he walks past the window, outside, lo and behold, there's the Dark One or Shamael, whoever you wanna call him, um, but he is outside the house. Now this is important for a couple of different reasons. He's not just watching Perrin in his dream because let's face it, that's kind of what they're doing. But when Rand had his dream, he showed himself to Rand to scare him but he's further away from Perrin in this scene than he was from Rand. And I think that's because as Perrin comes around the corner, a wolf is there. Now we all know that Perrin is a wolf brother and wolves protect him. That's, Moraine even says that in the book series that he's found his own protection because the wolves do protect him within the wolf dream or the world of dreams, um, depending on how you want to look at it. And this is pretty interesting because the wolf is eating the body of his dead wife. And she turns around and looks at him and says, I know. Now, a lot of foreshadowing here, I think. So there's been a ton of theories, and I mentioned a theory in my last Easter egg video with Lila in for episode one, that she was a dark friend and that she was trying to kill Perrin. I still hold to that. Now, we know that in the Eye of the World in the book series, near the very end, Rand is basically tempted with his mother because the Dark One grabbed her soul and used her against him um, during their battle. And we all know it was a Shamael, not really the Dark One. But I think they're going to trade things up a little bit here, and it's going to be just a bit different. It'll be Perrin instead. And I'm going to say that maybe some of Dana's speech when they're in um, the Four Kings Inn with uh, Matt and Rand is going to have some importance later on about breaking the world, about all of the bad things that are happening, about breaking the wheel, no more time, um, which is essentially what Moradin and Ashamiel really wanted, and they talked about that quite extensively throughout the later books. I'm going to say that maybe appealed to Lila because there's been a lot of thoughts that maybe she had a miscarriage, maybe she was pregnant, maybe there was a child involved prior to, and it's no longer there. Uh, there's a lot of speculation on what's going on there, and maybe she turned to the Dark One out of sadness and fear. 
I don't know. But this sort of looks like the wolf is is protecting Perrin from uh, the Dark One or Ishamael, and maybe, just maybe, he's also protecting him from the image of his dead wife that is summoned there. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down below in the description box. I'm still holding to the theory that she is a dark friend, and we're going to see her later on in the series in a flashback or two, or maybe in another dream sequence like this. All right. This isn't so much an Easter egg as a really good picture of Ishamael. Now, uh, for non-book readers, they're probably going to wonder why he has eyes of fire, his skin is all destroyed, and his, his big furnace for a mouth. Uh, essentially what this is, is he is almost exclusively at this point in the book series using what's known as the true power. This is power drawn directly from the Dark One and no one else. So he's not using the one power, he's not using the male half of the true source, he's using the true power. And in the late stages of true power addiction, the eyes turn to caverns of fire, the mouth turns into a furnace, um, all kinds of really bad things happen to your body, insanity, things like that. And at this point in the series, he really does think he's the Dark One because he's pretty much that far gone. And I think that's right up until the end of The Dragon Reborn when Rand defeats him for the third time um, before he is reborn later on in the series that he thinks that. So again, really good shot of this. A lot of the non-book readers and other people watching this, that's the Dark One, that's who that is. It's, it's Shamiel for sure. Um, but I'm wondering how they're doing this. Is it just his projection? Is he going to showcase himself like this when he's using the true power later on? I'm really interested to see, and I want to hear all of your thoughts on that down below in the comments. Let me know. Do you think we're going to see a fight between this version of Shamiel at the end of the first season in, in Episode 8? Are we going to see maybe someone different, like Billy Zane? <laughs> Or whoever is cast as a Shamael, I'm not entirely sure myself. But let me know what you folks think. All right, now we're going to talk about this. This is when uh, Rand and Matt appear first in Breen Spring. Outside uh, Breen Spring, there's a cage with an Aiel in it. Uh, we've seen this from some promotional material before, and I had mentioned that this was an Aiel back then, and some people didn't think it was. However, when the episode came out, Obviously, it is Nihil because they say it is, but what he has there on his side looks to be a piece of amethyst. Um, I don't think this particular stone has much significance in any way, shape, or form, other than the fact that it's some loot that he has that Matt wants. Now, this Aiel in a cage is obvious foreshadowing to uh, the fact that we see Goal later on in the series when Perrin rescues him in a cage in a town, um, but this town is not the same one. So... What I want to talk about now is this. This is the inn. Outside the inn are these four pillars. Uh, Rand and Matt obviously go in the inn. This town is Breen Spring. Breen Spring is a town in the book series, however, it's not one they really meet uh, or go to or spend some time in. But Four Kings is, and Four Kings is where Rand first actively channels. Now, I know he channeled before in the book series uh, when he relieved Bella of her tiredness. However, this is when he first overtly channels and people really start to notice it that are reading the books. Um, and the town is called Four Kings. Of course, the innkeeper and his cronies are different than Dana the Dark Friend here in this inn. However, I think these four pillars outside carved into the image of kings, and the inn being the four kings, is a nod to that town and that scene in the books. Now, once they get inside, we see Tom, and a lot of people have said he doesn't have his multicolored cloak. It's pretty upsetting. Why doesn't he look like a gleeman? There are the patches right there. They're sewn on the inside of his coat. A little bit different. Change in the book series for sure, although most of his character so far has been changed anyway. Uh, so I don't know why this is a surprise to some people at this point. However, I do like it. I think the overt cloak with all the patches on it may not look really good. It might look cartoony, might not look um, how you would like it on the screen. I personally like this a lot better. He can showcase that he's a gleeman by flourishing his coat, and you can see the patches underneath without a gaudy, huge cloak over top of it. Now, I know that's probably not a popular opinion, and a lot of people are probably saying, well, I want to see the cloak. This is what they gave us. I personally like it. But again, it is there, and it's a small nod to the fact that he does wear a cloak like that in the book series. Now we're going to talk about this. Now, Tom in the book series is very light-fingered. He hides knives all about his person, and we're going to see that here in a second. Um, he is very nimble, uh, especially for a man of his advanced age in the book series. He showcases that here. Now, I incorrectly stated that he stole from Matt in an earlier episode when I talked about this, although in a roundabout way he kind of did because Matt gets stolen from and he lifts the purse from the person who steals from Matt. Now, this basically just shows that he has very light fingers, he's very nimble, he's very quick, um, sort of like in the book series. So I wanted to show that. Now we're going to talk about this. This is probably one... 
I'm going to say the second instance. Uh, the first instance was in episode two, when we start to see the taint from the dagger from Shader Logoth uh, work itself on Matt. This year, he is essentially, as Rand put it, a prick, um, and that's not really in Matt's character towards his friends. He's sort of carefree, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky. Um, even in the series, in the first episode, that's kind of what he seemed like, even though he did steal from uh, that, that lady in M1's field. It seems like he was doing it for the right reasons more than anything else. Here, he's just being an absolute ass for no reason. Um, and I think that is the dagger's taint starting to work itself on him. Now, we do know that in episode four, according to the trailer, we start to see a more physical, visual version of the taint because it's starting crawling in his mouth, uh, kind of like a, a Venom. Have you seen Venom? The alien symbiote? Like that, almost. Um, I don't know how I feel about that until I actually see the scene other than that one still. However, this is, I think, some really good acting by Barney Harris here. Now we're going to talk about the Tinkers. Um, so the reason I brought this image up is because a lot of people have complained about the Tinkers. They're not wearing multicolored, really garish, uh, bright colored clothing. They kind of sort of are. If you look how some of the other people are dressed, it's usually in solid colors, one or two colors at once, not many at the same time. And yet here you see kind of a hodgepodge, a mishmash. They're wearing a bunch of different colors all at the same time. May not be quite as bright as some people envisioned it from the book series. I think a few times Nynaeve says it made her blink. That's how bright it was. But I do like the costumes. I do like the way they look. Uh, even if I thought this particular scene was a little off, um, I do like the way the Tinkers look. All right, I mentioned uh, Tom and his knives. Again, another little nod to that here. It shows him pulling a knife out of his sleeve. It seems like he has an endless supply of them up his sleeves, in his boots, under his cloak, in his coat, things like that. And Matt sort of learns that from him in the books and does that as well. Um, but this is uh, a nice little nod to that in this scene where he's outside of the town with the Aiel when they're going to cut him down. All right, this is something else. Um, and Rave Judkins was actually asked about this in the AMA, and I didn't see if he had answered or not because the last time I checked, he hadn't. However, when Matt loots the body of the Aiel, he pulls this out, and this is a carved dog. So my guess is this is a little nod to the book readers that this Aiel may have been a stone dog. I'm not saying that they're going to carry uh, little amulets or little plaques or figurines or trinkets to showcase which warrior society they're from. However, this might be a small nod to the fans saying that this is a stone dog. It's my guess anyway. Um, let me know in the comments down below if you believe that as well. All right, now here, this is where we see Rand channeling overtly on screen for the first time. I don't believe there's an instance anywhere else in the book series, or in the show rather, that we've seen him use the one power um, visually. I don't think. Uh, if I missed it, let me know. I certainly haven't covered it in any Easter egg videos or anything. And if I did miss it, I want to know. But this is where this is an ironwood door, couldn't be broken down by three men, and he bangs into it just a couple of times, and then it falls down with him on top of it. Shocks Dana the Dark Friend. Um, I don't think it shocks Rand too much because he gets up and just runs away. However, a door that thick, that size, where she's saying that only three people can bust it down, and he really only hammers on it a couple of times and not that hard for it to fall down, he must be using the one power. Certainly not as flashy as the scene in Four Kings when he uses lightning to basically blast open the side of the inn for him and Matt to escape, although... Perhaps it's a subtle nod to that because they seem to be holding the identity of the dragon very close to their vests for the show. Um, and it could be anyone. It could be Matt, Perrin, Rand, Egwene. And at some points or another, they're even mentioned Nynaeve until we seen the first episode when we found out she was a little bit older than everyone else. However, I think they're going to do this right up until almost the final episode when they reveal Rand as the actual dragon. I don't believe they're going to change that in any way, shape, or form. But I think they're going to keep the audience guessing to that point. All right. Uh, so that's pretty much all I have here for the Easter eggs for the third episode. I've uh, I've talked here for a bit now. If I've missed anything, absolutely let me know in the comments down below. Send me the images if you have them. I'm going to compile a list of all the Easter eggs I missed for the first season after the first season finishes airing on December 24th. I'm going to do a full video with your folks' help, of course. So thank you so very much for sticking with me here to the very end. Here's to many more.